right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, and people, as you'll recall, we've got a very interesting project ahead of us. Very, very interesting project. We're looking at a model, a philosophical model called the Seven Steps to Enlightenment. As you know from last week's lecture, this model comes from something that the Shankaracharya of Puri, the current one, said in passing. No, it's like a fragment of a sentence. But as we said last week, in this sentence fragment is packed so much richness and nuance and sophistication that it's worth unpacking over and over and over again. Like I mentioned last week, this model, I'm calling it the seven steps to enlightenment or the seven rung ladder. Uh, it's the model whereby a person can be brought from the gross to the subtle, but also whereby a person can go from the subtle to the gross. So this seven rung ladder, these seven steps in this model that we're going to discuss represent a kind of kind of involution evolution model. Involution, the gross dissolving back into the subtle, the effect going back into the cause, and evolution, the cause emanating out or manifesting itself as the effect. So naturally, these are a series of seven steps from the subtlest to the grossest, or really from the grossest to the subtlest. And last week, I think we walked up three rungs of the ladder. We have four more rungs ahead of us. So this is really the second installment of a three-part lecture series. I think it will be three parts. I doubt that we'll cover all four rungs today. We might, but more realistically, if I am to finish on time, and that is my intention, uh, we're probably only going to cover the next two rungs of the ladder. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by reviewing a little bit what we did last week. We're going to discuss very briefly the three rungs of the ladder that we've already covered and what their significance is. Then we'll start to sketch out the next two rungs of the ladder. And in the last part of today's class, maybe we'll talk a little bit about what next week's class will be about, which is the kind of home run, the last two rungs of the ladder that will take us all the way to the absolute. I will stress again that this model is very profound because the first three rungs alone are sufficient unto themselves to create a lasting, abiding, and genuine realization, uh, sorry, uh, renunciation in all those who realize the full significance of what has been said. And so the first three rungs of the ladder, as we'll explain a bit shortly, um, represent a way to renounce the world and no longer be a victim to your cravings, to your frustrations, to your fears. The first three rungs of a ladder, of this ladder, when understood, will represent freedom from that which never had the power to harm you anyway, never had the power to tempt you anyway, but was given that power because of the lack of understanding that indeed this world is unreal. Indeed, this world, this perceivable universe can be reduced to the five elements, the play of the five elements, and that in turn can be reduced to Maya, the inscrutable and paradoxical realm of illusion that we typically call Maya. Now, the next two rungs of the ladder are going to be about something very interesting. Why did this Maya come about anyway? And how? You know, that's the question. Because thus far, we've conveniently left God out of the picture. And we've also left, maybe more importantly, you out of the picture. We've discussed quantum mechanics and quantum theory and paradoxes within time, space, and causality. We discussed why this world of seeming diversity can be reduced to even more and more fundamental layers of illusion. But nowhere have we inserted God or the soul or the individual. So what's that about? And today, hopefully, we're going to do just that. We're going to ask the question in this lecture, how did this Maya, this universe, how did it come into being? You know, why did it come into being? What was the cause? What was the origin of the emergence of this manifold universe, this infinitely variegated realm of experience that we call Maya? Whence forth did it spring? That's going to be the question of today's lecture. And really, the strategy is as follows. I'm going to list for you, God willing, five different models. They are theories from 5,000 years of Indian spiritual tradition. And you'll see that these theories have their echoes in the very cutting edge ideas of quantum mechanics and of philosophy and of science. So you'll hear echoes of these ancient Indian ideas in the discourses of the world's leading quantum mechanics uh, experts today. Now, often we stress, it's not that the great Indian sages and rishis and seers knew quantum mechanics or mathematics, not quite. Right. It's not it's not that they were all attending courses on like, you know, Higgs boson particle diffraction, like like in, in 3000 BC India. It's more likely that they arrived upon a truth 
that is universal and accessible to anyone who inquires deeply enough. And it just so happens that thousands, literally thousands of years later, hundreds of centuries later, other people in other cultures are arriving upon those same truths in different ways which I think only speaks to the validity and universality of those truths. That these truths that we're gonna to discuss today, really truth singular, since as we discussed in a previous lecture, truths can never be plural, but these versions of truth, or rather these explanations of the one truth, these various grades of the one truth, they are not uh, confined to any one culture. They don't belong to India any more than math belongs to like the Arabic world. You know, the early Arabs were perhaps the first to discover the laws of mathematics, the early Greeks, they were perhaps the first to articulate and discover all these laws. But if the Arabs and the Greeks were not around, someone else would have discovered them. And if the entirety of humanity were to be wiped out today, if all of India were to go underwater today, it's okay. I mean, ultimately, we have to say that we're non-dualist. Uh, but and it would be a great tragedy. But it would be okay insofar as these universal truths, this truth does not die with India. It lives on like perhaps even in the ether waiting to be discovered by some future people, you know? So these are universal truths. They're very deep. Um, and necessarily then to tonight's conversation is going to feature some of the deepest and subtlest metaphysics. So I want to say one thing about metaphysics before we begin. Of course, when you hear these echoes in modern quantum mechanics experts, you, you should understand that we're talking about the very frontiers of physics. We're talking about the very margins of language. We're trying really as hard as we can to express the inexpressible with a language that is wholly unsuited for it. Language was not made to do what it is that we're setting out to do today. Language was not made to describe the absolute, which is unfettered by time, unencumbered by form, uncircumscribed by space. Silence is the closest approximation. And even that doesn't do justice for this one truth that is beyond all mental categories of existence and non-existence. The thing that we're going to be discussing today is not a thing. It's a no thing. And as such, our thing based language, our materialist and sensualist language structures are wholly inept at trying to express it. Yet the effort will be made all the same. So as we discuss today's very subtle and nuanced theme of a deep metaphysical speculation, there are many who I think feel like this is not a productive discussion. There are many who feel like metaphysical inquiries are speculative at best and perhaps not important, not practical, not worth our time. You've probably encountered people like this. We, we have had many times in our life felt this way. Like, why should we launch into such descriptions of the metaphysical nature of things? I mean, is it really that important? How practical could it be? Hmm? Right? I feel like that attitude has come to a lot of us. Here at the top of the lecture, before we even began, I'd like to say that the metaphysical question of what this world is fundamentally, the metaphysical question of what you are at your essence nature, the metaphysical question of what is the absolute nature of reality? There could be no question more practical than this. And it has many forms, right? These are various ways of asking the same question. What am I? What is this world? What is it for? What is reality made of? What is the ultimate nature? What is the fundamental substratum of existence? What is existence? What is consciousness? What is bliss? These questions, what is God? These are all various ways of asking the same question. And I'm going to call it in today's lecture, the metaphysical question. It necessarily includes the theory of origination. It necessarily involves a creation theory. It has to include a discussion as to how all of this came about before we can even begin the discussion of why it all came about or what to do about it. And insofar as there are those who would tell you that this question is not practical, we offer this response. In order to know what to do with something, you must first know what it is. If you don't know what something is, how will you know to use it? How will you know what to do with it? Is this not as true of your life and of this world as it is of your IKEA furniture? <laughs> it would be tragic. And by the way, there are some Scandinavian designs that do not at all look like couches or tables or cupboards until you put it together. Right? So you might come home with your IKEA furniture and you might open the box and imagine if there was no picture whatsoever as to what this product is supposed to look like. There was no manual to like make the whatever it was, and you were just left there with all of these parts, you would probably hack and slash and fumble around for hours and end up with something that is wholly impractical, wholly unusable, and utterly dissatisfying. 
Does this sound familiar? It should, because that's the way most of us are living our lives. We haven't paused to ask the fundamental questions of what we are, what this world is. And as such, we have no idea what to do with our life and what to do in this world. And like building an IKEA furniture piece without any instructions, we're hacking away at this life at, uh, with, with great and grave consequences. There's so much frustration, so much dissatisfaction, so much misery, and all because we misplaced the user's manual for crying out loud. <laughs> So my claim at the beginning of the lecture is that you will never know what to do with your life. You will never know what to do with this world until you first know what it is. The metaphysical question is the most practical question and the most fundamental question. It is prior to all other questions. And once it is answered, then only do the other questions become available, like ethical questions, axiological questions about beauty, about value, about meaning making. All of that becomes possible only insofar as we have a firm grounding in the metaphysical question and hopefully in the metaphysical answer. Okay, so that's my response to those who would consider this impractical. There are many who consider today's discussion to be, because of its highly you know, metaphysical nature, to be a kind of escapism, you know, like a navel gazing, like, oh, here you are in your ivory towers discussing these lofty Vedantic ideas. Why don't you like get involved with the world, you know? What, 42 could end the lecture right now. I know Amy, just, 42, you know, hitchhiker's guy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thanks, Amy. But like, why, why would we do this? Because some people feel like all the time we take to discuss metaphysics is time taken away um, from the world, from being active and participating in the world. To this, we would say inaction is probably better than misguided action. So if you are going to take some time away from hacking and slashing in a haphazard way to figure out how to do things correctly, it's better that you don't do anything at all until you know the lay of the land. It's like walking into a room and hearing your friend screaming and crying, but not knowing really what he's upset about, and then starting to offer him advice anyway without knowing the full details of his situation. That would be incredibly glib, incredibly irresponsible, and will probably result in more harm than good. In that sense, we would say action is not in and of itself good, you know? Inaction is preferable to misaligned action. So insofar as you feel like this is a waste of time, I don't think so. I think this is an investment in correct uh, uh, action. Also, hello, Myra. I'm so happy to see Myra. Whenever I see old friends, I'm like overjoyed. Hi, dear Myra. Tuning in from Malaysia, I think. I don't know, but welcome. So um, now we have to ask, okay, what about escapism? There's a sense in which when we engage in highly metaphysical discussions, like the one we're about to have tonight, God willing, Oh my God, I'm talking this up so much. Now you're going to be like, this was so unnuanced. You're going to be like, what are we? <laughs> but no, uh, there is a sense in which people feel like if we engage in metaphysical discussion, it's like an escapism. You know, well, shouldn't we be thinking about practical stuff? Already we've discussed how this is practical, but I want to say one more further response. And it's this. The only real escapism is avoiding the fundamental questions of our life, because these questions are difficult to answer. Necessarily, they force us to confront deeply held assumptions, beliefs, and values. Many of those have been conditioned into us and indoctrinated into us from a very young age that they have a certain force. We might feel imprisoned by them, but the prison gives us a sense of safety. So we're reluctant to hand over the reins, to hand over our, sorry, our chains, you know, that we're reluctant to escape the prison. And so we cling on to these ideas and we're afraid of any questioning that might undo these common core beliefs. And so as a result, in order to avoid and in order to escape confronting these fundamental questions about reality, we busy ourselves with our lives. We climb the corporate ladder, we try to acquire more money, we try to acquire more fame, we try to acquire more followers, or we get involved with some NGO, we just like do, 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 do. We try to be as active as we could possibly be. We avoid any lull in any conversation. We're afraid of silence. We're afraid of two hours uh, where we are left to our own devices, lest these questions should, should suddenly bubble up from the deep abyss of the moment, right? We're terrified of a question such as, what is death? What am I? What is life? So I would argue that the real escapism is the avoidance of these questions, plunging headfirst into the vanities of the world to avoid asking the thing, the thing that would make this world truly meaningful. So I would argue that this is an escapism, but turning around to face the issue head on. Um, and as such, it has inestimable value for us. Okay, so much for preamble. Let's get right into it. What does Amy say? 
Yeah, it's like with the donkey and exactly. I love that story about the, the rope. We'll maybe revisit it in the Q&A. So this is why, although today's discussion will be highly metaphysical, it's highly practical too. Now, let's say a few things about these five theories of causality. They're pulled from various different schools of Indian philosophy, Buddhism, Sankhya, Nyaya, Vasheshika, um, theories about karma, all that. Uh, and you'll hear, of course, there are modern echoes in the pundits of today in both East and West, but I'm mainly basing this lecture off the fourth chapter of Gaudapada's Mandukya Karika. So this is my next bit of disclaimer, okay? Gaudapada is what we would call a radical non-dualist. He probably lived in the eighth century AD, uh, which is maybe a century before Shankaracharya, the great compiler of non-duality. So Advaita Vedanta, as we know it, comes to us largely through the commentaries of Shankaracharya. So Sri Shankara um, commented upon maybe 10 or 11 Upanishads. He commented upon the Bhagavad Gita and he commented upon the Brahma Sutra. And his commentaries are of a highly non-dualistic nature. We can sum this up with one statement. God alone exists. This world is an illusion. And you are none other than God. That's kind of like the formula that summarizes Shankara's non-duality. Uh, in Sanskrit, Brahma Satyam, Jagan Mitya, Jiva, Brahmeva, Naparaha. God or the absolute reality alone exists. The principle called existence, consciousness, bliss, that alone exists. This world is but an appearance. It has no second reality or no objective existence apart from this absolute principle of existence, consciousness, bliss. And you, you as you are now, are none other than this absolute reality. You're not broken in need of fixing. You're not deficient in need of healing or growing. There's nothing wrong with you except that you don't understand what your true fundamental nature is. <laughs> That's Shankara's Advaita summed up in one sentence. Brahma Satyam, Jagan Mitya, Jiva, Brahmeva, Naparaha. Brahman alone is real. Brahman in Sanskrit means the vast. Basically, the vastest thought a human mind is able to conceive. And even beyond that, that's what Brahman is. The vastest idea that language can express. And even beyond that, that's Brahman. And that's none other than what you are. And only it exists. So it would be wrong to say everything is God. No, that's, that's baloney. Everything is not God. Only God is. Everything is not. As Swami Vivekananda said so beautifully in his poem to Mary Hill. I have never taught so strange a doctrine. Only God is. Everything is not. Not everything is God, right? So this isn't pantheism. It's not at all panentheism. It's not really even theistic monism since this absolute principle of reality is more of a principle than a person. And so really we could call it absolute monism. If you must use a philosophical label, then it would probably be absolute monism. Um, and it's like one, one scholar said, this is basically Buddhism with God. <laughs> It's Buddhism plus God. Like that's, that's how they described it. So much is eerily, eerily similar with Buddhism, especially the Tibetan Buddhist, Tantric Buddhist, you know, like the uh, Prasangika Madhyamika schools of Buddhism. A lot of parallels between that Shentong Madhyamika Buddhist school and these Advaitic schools. Anyway, what I want to stress though, before beginning the lecture is that Shankara's teacher's teacher is Gaudapada. So the lineage is Gaudapada, then Govindapada, then Shankara. And then after Shankara, there's like Padma Pada and a whole bunch of other masters. But Shankara is typically who we go to when we want to study non-duality. It's his commentaries on the Gita, on the Brahma Sutra, and on the Upanishads that we refer to in our study and understanding of the Upanishads, of the Advaita Vedanta system. Okay. Compared to Gaudapada, Shankara is a, like a moderate. <laughs> He's like, he, compared to Gaudapada, Shankara goes easy on you. And those of you who've studied Shankara, you know, that's quite a big statement, right? Shankara, the same Shankara who said, trying to realize the truth and at the same time becoming involved in the vanities of the world, like lust and greed, is as dangerous as trying to cross a river, holding on to a crocodile, mistaking it for driftwood. The very same Shankara who would tell you that all your ambitions, all your passions, all the things you find valuable in the world is nothing like silver appearing, a falsely appearing in oysters under the moonlight. The very same Shankara who would tell you that all your fears are nothing but a rope appearing in the pre-dawn light as a snake. The same Shankara who would call all of your passions, all of your ambitions, your idea of the future, your idea of the past, an illusion. That Shankara is nowhere near as hardcore and as radical as this Gaudapada who we're going to be discussing today. Gaudapada to me represents the very pinnacle of Hindu non-duality of Advaitic thinking. And as such, when you study Gaudapada, I should warn you that it can be incredibly disconcerting at times. 
The stuff that we might be talking about today can be thrilling, truly, truly thrilling, but also rather frightening. You know, they might uh, be an affront to you. They might confront you, especially if you are of a devotional nature. Sometimes um, that can be challenged if we come into this with a rather superficial understanding. As Justin and I were discussing, though, a deep and true understanding of non-duality leads to genuine devotion. You cannot love what you do not know. And even Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, of all my devotees, the ones who I love most are the ones who know me. They're the ones who truly worship me. The jnanis make the best bhaktas. So if you really understand what Gaudapada is saying, then you can truly love the divine. But if you don't, then you might be scared. Actually, arguably, if you do understand Gaudapada, it's still kind of scary. I'm scared when I read Gaudapada often. And that's why I like it. It's like a horror movie. It's like a philosophical horror movie. Um, so you might be, you might be a little scared, you know, you can hold each other's hand or something, turn on the lights anytime you want. Gaudapada, he lives in the, like, literally he was in the Himalayas. He's like a wandering monk, um, super, super, super renunciant. And we're going to be studying Gaudapada's yeah, commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad, which is one of the more radical and non-dual of the Upanishads. So just to give you a picture of what we're going to do today, we're taking a very radical Upanishad, the Mandukya, then we're taking a very exceedingly radical non-dualist commentary of the Mandukya Upanishad. I'm going to put in the chat, Gaudapada's Mandukya Karaka. And we're going to use his ideas in chapter four of the Karaka to rubbish all notions of creation that were presented to him at his time that are still available to us today in the modern discourse of the leading experts in philosophy and quantum mechanics. He's attempting in verse, uh, sorry, chapter four to rubbish the notion that there is a world at all. His central claim is that this world, and I don't mean to like spoil it for you, but this is the punchline. His central claim is that this world, I, I assume that all of you already know what's going to happen. Many of you have already studied this for a while. His central claim is that this world doesn't exist. It's an illusion. It has no second reality apart from Brahman. So um, it's not a real effect and therefore no real cause needs to be posited. It's an appearance. But in order to arrive at that conclusion, he takes up every other theory of creation and empties it out of meaning, shows through reasoning that these theories are pure absurdity. And in some sense, this is a neti neti approach. He's taking a theory and he's saying, could this be the theory of creation? Nah, thank you. Next. Another theory comes out. He's like, could this be the theory of creation? Nah, thank you. Next. Right. So he's Ariana grande all these various theories until he arrives upon the truth uh, via negativa. So this is just textbook neti neti, not this, not that, which is the standard method of doing non-duality. After all, what we're looking for is the one looking. It cannot be affirmed any more than an eye can see itself, any more than a knife can cut itself, any more than a screwdriver can screw itself. Um, this thing is not something, it's a no thing. And as such, it cannot be affirmed in positive terms. It must be arrived at in a flash of insight through a uh, reductio ad absurdum or through elimination or through via negativa. So it's almost like you don't know that the answer is B. Nobody will tell you the answer is B, but you know it's not A, C, and D. Therefore, it must be B, right? That's, and, and hopefully you recognize the word play here. There's nothing to do. You just have to be. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Now, Shami um, Sarvapiranaji gave a beautiful talk on the Mandukya Karaka, I think it was a series of talks. And he also discussed um, these, these various schools of, of Indian philosophy and Gaudapada's response to those schools. What Swami Sarvapirananda does is really beautiful. Swami Sarvapirananda talks about like Michio Kaku and his book, The God Delusion. Oh, sorry, The God Equation. That's Richard, Richard Dawkins, the God Delusion guy. Michio Kaku is the God Equation. He talks about Jim Holt. And Swami Sarvapirananda is really tapped into like, you know, Harvard and that world of Boston intellectual intelligentsia, you know, and, and so he um, manages to compare a lot of what Gaudapada is saying to what modern scientists and, and philosophers are saying. So for that, I'm hugely indebted. I'm drawing a lot from that lecture too. So that's the citations of these, this, this talk. You know, I, I will link you to Swami Sarpa in this talk, maybe if you'd like, and I'll point you to Gaudapada's text, the Mandukya Karika, which is a commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad for you to study this further. But that being said, let's just dive in. Huh? So let's go right into what Gaudapada has to say. Okay, so we started last week with the very obvious stuff. We started with the world as we know it, the perceivable universe. You'll recall, this is the grossest, most tangible, most obvious manifestation of reality. And our intention here is to walk up the ladder from that which is gross to that which is subtle. And as we said last week, by gross, I don't mean like, ew, icky. I mean, just tangible and earthy and here. So a good teacher 
will take us from what we know and slowly holding our hands lead us to what we don't know. That's what Gaudapada is going to do. That's what this seven-runged ladder is going to do. The seven-pronged model from the Shankaracharya of Puri. Okay, so we're going to start with what we do know. And as we said last week, no one can deny that we are experiencing a world. No philosophy will deny your experience of this world. While indeed that uh, this, the reality of the world is denied, as we'll discuss in a little bit, that you are experiencing it is not denied. That would be ridiculous to say that there was no world and neither did you experience one. No, you did experience it. You, you know that you're experiencing it. Right now you're experiencing it. So let's at least start there. So we said last week, that if you take this world as it is, we just call it Jagat. And in that word Jagat is included all planets, solar systems, you know, all um, galaxies, all clusters, all superclusters, maybe even all the multiverses, anything that's perceivable or conjecturable, I guess. Okay, that's the known universe or the perceivable universe. Now, we said that all of this, the infinite variety of the perceivable universe can be reduced. It can be reduced to the play of the five elements. Now, we used a rather antiquated model the five elements being earth, water, you know, Prithvi, earth, up, water, vayu, sorry, uh, tejas, fire, vayu, wind, and uh, akasha, space. So we said these five elements, like in the Indian system and the Chinese system, are seen to be fundamental. And, and like we said, in principle, that's exactly what Anton Lavoisier was trying to do too, when he started his new periodic table, which we still use today. It's the idea of like a periodic table and elements, or the idea of basic particles like quarks or like atoms, you know, super strings, whatever. In principle, a physicist, a really good one, or a chemist even, will be able to reduce all of this to a few basic properties. And everything that you see is some configuration some recombination of these basic properties. So everything you see around you is just atoms configured like this, configured like that. Maybe they're all just super strings. Now it's appearing as a table. Now it's appearing as a thais, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you could say in the Indian system, principle is the same. Everything you see around you is some combination of these five elements. That means you have a powerful tool for enunciation. Why should you prefer one thing over another? Why should you have attachments? That which you are attached to is nothing but the five elements. What is it beyond that? That which you are averse to, again, is nothing but the five elements. Why should you be averse to it? That's nothing. There's nothing here but the five elements. All you're doing is superimposing onto these five elements, stories and narratives. And these very stories and narratives chain you to a cycle of attachment and aversion, pleasure and pain, happiness and sorrow. And only because you have failed to see it for what it is, nothing but the play of five elements. So we went from Jaga to a slightly subtler version of reality, Pancha. Bhuta Vilasa, the play of the five elements. And I'll put that in the chat. Jagat, then we move from Jagat, that's the first one, to the second one, Pancha, meaning five, Bhuta, meaning elements, Vilasa, meaning play. This whole thing is the play of the five elements. Then, as you'll recall from last week, we went from Pancha Bhuta Vilasa to Maya. By the way, you don't need to make the step to achieve renunciation. You could stop at Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, and any good scientist would. Um, and that alone is enough to give you renunciation. I will stress again that there is no genuine spirituality without renunciation. Spirituality, honestly speaking, is the cultivation of renunciation. It's the gradual deepening of your ability to let go of that which is unreal and hold on truly to that which is real. They are mutually exclusive. Light and dark cannot inhere together in the same room. Once you turn on the candle, gone is the darkness. And under understandably, a candle light is small, but as the fire grows, the darkness gets pushed away. They are mutually exclusive. Light and darkness cannot coexist. Okay, this is a basic principle. And by the way, a room might have been dark for aeons. All it takes is one single flash of light and that darkness is dispelled forever. So it doesn't matter if ignorance is beginningless. It is endless. It's not endless because the moment illumination comes and it can come to anybody for any reason at any time, it's like striking a match. The darkness is dispersed. So similarly, worldliness, the attachment to external experience as a means of fulfillment, that will go away the moment you realize that what you're seeking is nothing but the five elements. Lust is significantly reduced if you can consider this morbid attachment, as Swamiji said beautifully, this morbid attachment for flesh to flesh. If you really consider what's going on here, you'll realize, why should I hanker after these five elements? They're the same five elements that are in that body are in this body, are in this chair, are in this tree. Gone is lust if you can truly understand there's nothing there that isn't here, right? Gone is greed when you understand that gold and clay are made of the same thing. They're both just the five elements, both just earth. Why privilege gold over clay? It's not different from one another. 
You see, a good scientist without any spirituality or theology or any kind of religious quasi-mystical vocabulary, a good scientist, if they were to stay true to what they've discovered in their inquiry, should be a renunciant. <laughs> or at least they should be peaceful. They should be infinitely peaceful, having at least mitigated the intensity of craving and the intensity of fear. Nothing is here other than the five elements. So relax. Boogeyman is made of five elements, right? So relax. What is it to you? <laughs> but anyway, we can go further because you could say, okay, fine, but there's still something, right? Five elements are still something. And maybe like you could say, these five elements are a set of elements apart from the ones that are here. Even though they're fundamentally what I am, I would like to add more. I want to be five elements plus those five elements. And I want to be two sets of five elements. I don't know. As long as the world is somewhat real, it's somewhat desirable. And so renunciation is not yet complete. So we go now to the next step, which is Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. I recognize that I said it twice. It's good. This is good pedagogy. You have to stress the important parts of the lecture. So I have to stress that this world is Maya. What does that mean? It means that it's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and ultimately illusory. But we haven't really gotten to it being illusory yet. Suffice to say, this world is indeed a paradox. And we tried to prove that last week, offering various arguments as to how time is paradoxical, as to how space is paradoxical. You know, we used Zeno's paradox and we used um, an appeal to Godel's incompleteness theorems in mathematics. We appeal to Heisenbergian uncertainty and the Copenhagen inference. We did many appeals to quantum mechanics, both theoretical and experimental. And we appeal to philosophy, both ancient and modern, to show that this world, it's very laws is in and of themselves an error. <laughs> and you know, in logic, when you do formal logic, you can prove any um, axiom, or I, I guess you could say any proposition, you can prove any proposition by proving a contradiction in its opposite. Okay, so if I say, um, take proposition A, its opposite is not A. If I go through the steps of reasoning, then I arrive at like say a contradiction, it disproves not A, which indirectly proves A. Okay, so if the opposite of A is false, then A must be true. And so the world is that which is here, that which you can see, and we disprove it using reason and logic, using appeals to modern and ancient philosophy. We show the contradiction. We, we reductio ad absurdum, time, space, and causality, which is the matrix of reality as we know it. And therefore, by invalidating this proposition, we actually prove its opposite. Hint, hint, God, right? And so Sri Ramakrishna can easily say, this world is nothing, God alone is real. That's why the Bible time and time again tells us not to lay up our treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart lies. So if your treasure is out in the world, you'll be thinking about the world. And like Mick Jagger, you can't get no satisfaction there. Okay, but once you realize the world is an error, then you also realize that that's why you've been so unhappy because you've been premising your entire happiness on an error, on a paradox, on a logical incongruity. Once you know that, then you can live more intelligently because no longer will you premise your life on those external rewards like money, fame, pleasure. No external experience, however noble and beautiful and pure, will ever ultimately do it for you. Why? Because the external world is premised on this paradox the paradox of time, the paradox of space, the paradox of causality. Okay, all well and good. And I think a couple of, maybe many weeks ago, actually, we talked a little bit about why this world is unreal and we appeal to different arguments than these ones, like the water boiling. You remember that one? Heat is, intrins is not intrinsic to the water any more than existence is intrinsic to bodies, mind. You remember that? Anyway, that was from a different lecture. We won't revisit it. But there are other arguments too to prove this world is not objectively and independently real. Now, let's go further. So let's take the next step in this journey together. Let's prove that the world is indeed not independently real. By the way, this takes on the material reductionist worldview head on. Because according to material reductionism, which is this modern philosophical fad, so we currently live under the world dominated by material reductionism. That's the, it's not always been this way. It's a very modern theory, but it's the current philosophical fad. It's kind of what we all are born into, what we're indoctrinated into, and what we just believe, prima facie, without any kind of inquiry. But this is the belief. And it is a belief, as you'll see in a bit. Matter and energy are fundamental. The fundamental nature of reality is premised on matter and energy. They exist, and they exist objectively, independently of any perceivers. So you don't need humans or any other conscious being 
to be there for this world to exist. This world has independent objective existence, right? Kind of the dominant theory today. It's called material reductionism. Everything can be reduced to matter and energy. And that is objectively real. What is consciousness then, according to this worldview? Uh, very simply, consciousness is in the material reductionist paradigm, um, a side effect or an emergent property. It's an afterthought. You know, so somehow matter is configured in such a way as to create a body, which over a long period of evolution evolves a brain. <laughs> Bernal. No, Bernal, you're ruining the punchline. No, I'm kidding. He's right. He's right. This is an error for an obvious reason. And we can show it. We don't need to appeal to some holy book and say, God created the world. No, no. We can prove it easily. It's such an easily provable position that this material reductionist worldview is wrong. But anyway, let's let's at least sketch it out first before we take it down. Now, the brain evolves after a series of years, I mean, evolutionary process of the brain. And then somehow, nobody knows how, but somehow the brain with its infrastructure produces this first person experience called consciousness. Okay, so we're conscious of this world. We're, we're experiencers. We're, we're aware of having this experience. And it's because the brain is somehow emanating it. The brain is somehow creating it. But how is the brain creating it? Now, this is where the shoe pinches, as Swami Vivekananda would say. A material reductionist believes on faith that there is indeed a link between the brain and the mind. They believe on faith that the brain does indeed produce a mind. Why do they believe this? Because if you damage the brain, you damage the personality. Here's the problem, though. The personality is not the first person experience. The personality is not the experiencer. It's an experience that the experiencer is having. So Phineas Gage, he's a first person experiencer, somewhat beyond the phenomena called Phineas Gage. So obviously, if you blow out a part of his brain, he will be more violent and aggressive. And he's aware of that. In his first person experience, he's aware that his aggression has increased. And unfortunately, so are you. Much to your chagrin, he's a much worse guy to be around. Okay, just because there's a correlation between the brain and behavior doesn't necessarily mean there's a link, uh, by no means a causal link, between the brain and the phenomena, the very mysterious phenomena of a first-person experience. No scientist would really ever honestly posit this con uh, causal link. And in philosophy, uh, or I should say in the philosophy of mind, this is called the hard problem of consciousness. The wonderful Google and the hard problem of consciousness, a paper that David Chalmers put out, basically showing how uh, this is not a causal link. It's not even a correlation. Uh, it's very, very difficult to show how the brain and the mind are related, if at all. You can map the brain to remarkable degrees of precision, right? You can really, really, really study the physical stuff called the brain, but you'll never be able to show how the neurosynaptic firing equals causally first person experience very difficult to do that and also um this isn't a very good philosophy but i should mention it that there are like dossiers and dossiers and dossiers worth of research into like past lives and reincarnation and extra sensory perception all of that like no scientist wants to look at that some do to their credit but it's there there's tremendous research done into these kinds of things that show that the mind perhaps goes beyond the brain i just thought i'd put it out there i don't Sin, like I don't actually mean to use it as a defense, you know. I don't think that would be very a uh, lot of integrity there. But I just want you to know that that's out there. You know, there's like dossiers worth of stuff on mind going beyond the brain. I think Om Seti is a good example, a Victorian English woman in the 1890s who somehow had remarkable memory of her life as a priestess of Isis in Egypt. So much so that she was able to help archaeologists with their digs. Very mysterious, very eerie. Who knows about these kind of phenomena? But they do happen and they do further obfuscate the link between the brain and the mind. Anyway, let's move on. I want to point you to something else too, something even subtler. And it's in philosophy called the category error. Now, a cate category error is when you conflate two categories and try to relate them when truly they're categorically different and so cannot be related. An example would be the number two and the color red. What's the relationship between two and red? Can two produce red? Can red produce two? No, they're categorically different. No two will give you a red and no red will give you a two. Two doesn't affect red, red doesn't affect two. They're categorically different. The subject, meaning the first person experiencer, is categorically different from the object, the things and mo emotions and thoughts that the subject experiences. So Phineas Gage is an object, that person called Phineas Gage. He's an object. To whom? To the subject of his first person experience. And in fact, let's not talk about Phineas Gage. Let's talk about you. Right now, you're sitting here. You're aware of these words. 
Um, you're aware of the world around you, but you're also aware of your thoughts, no? You're aware that you are a person called such and such. That means the personality and all the thoughts that make it up, the emotions and all the sensations that you call the physical world, all of that is an object. Consciousness studies, it's a misnomer because in conscious studies, they're studying not the subject, they're studying objects. If you ask any consciousness studies expert in the West what they're studying, they'll probably tell you this, oh, memories, dreams, personality, thoughts. If you were a Vedantist, you will laugh at that and say rather sadly, my friend, my brother, I'm sorry, but you're not doing consciousness studies. You're just doing sukshma sharira studying. You're just stud studying the subtle body. You're studying perceptrons. You're studying the subtle world of thoughts and emotions. You're not studying the subject, which is a category wholly apart of all these various objects like thoughts, emotions, world, sensation, etc. Okay. So just like two and red are categorically different, the subject, the first person experiencer, and the objects that the first person experiences is wholly categorically different. So it would be a category error then to say that you can study the subject as an object. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? It would be ridiculous to say I can look for the subject in a microscope. Didn't David Hume say, I have exhaustively tried to find this self and I can't find it anywhere. Of course you can't, you dolt. I'm sorry, I'm just, <laughs> I'm getting passionate here. I'm like, of course you can't. You are the one searching. How can a finger point to itself? How can a knife cut itself? How can an eye look at itself? Okay, don't speak ill of the dead. So forgive me, Mr. Hume. I do love your work, especially your stuff about the sunrise and like optimistic induction. So I do love your work. But on this point, I think you are wholly, wholly, wholly off the mark. Okay. <laughs> and I have to stress this strongly because it's such stupidity. And yet it is so widely held. And not only by like everyday people, it's held by the top leading intellectuals who make a big deal of being like on the top of their field. They have been conflating for centuries, almost the subject with the object. And as such, have been using that to denigrate and condescend to mystics and religious people and spiritual people all throughout our modern era. You know? So somewhat passionately, my response is, wait, 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 everybody sit down. There's a mistake. And the mistake is this, a category error. It's a conflation of the object with the subject. You cannot study the subject objectively any more than the color two is red. You hear that? It's weird, right? The color two is red. The number green is four. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, not quite. Not quite, Ashwarya. Upadhi is a little bit different. But you could say, yeah, it's, it's, it's Avidya. It's in Maya. It's Maya. And you, Ramakrishna Paramahansa would say, would, say, would say about this probably something like, oh, mother, how inscrutable is your Maya? You see all of these people running around looking for their face. <laughs> oh, no. It's like running around looking for their glasses, which have always been on their face. It's like that. It's like kind of preposterous and it's ridiculous that the leading intellectuals of our time are looking in microscopes for the eyes that are looking you know it's it's funny it's a joke and we could say that's maya you can almost always like swing an arm and say ah mahamayi oh great enchantress oh goddess you've done it again you got us haha -ha. you know that's the attitude a tantrika should have regarding how silly our predicament is you know i think even kabir that great sufi poet he says beautifully uh He's one of those wonderful Hindu Muslims who like blurs the line between different religions and says, no, it's all one truth. And so I love Kabir. We love uh, any kind of mystic like that. And so he says beautifully, you know, the fish, he got a poem about the fish, how they're, they go to the guru and they're complaining of thirst and the guru fish laughs and laughs and laughs. It's like that. You're a fish in the water and you're complaining of thirst. Similarly, you're a scientist looking for the looker. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And therein is the joke. So this is, you can see it in Thomas Nagel's paper, What's It Like to Be a Bat? I really like that paper. What's it like to be a bat? He's also kind of like a leading. There, there are some of these really great American and, and uh, European intellectuals who are coming to the conclusions of the Vedas and the Upanishads independently, which I think is good, actually. As Swami Sarpananda said to um, Deepak Chopra, he said, Deepak Ji, it's actually good that these people are arriving at these conclusions independently without any reference to the Upanishads. Because you know, the intellectual community would completely oust them if they started making appeals to mystical spiritual traditions. But if they're arriving at the same conclusions through hard science and hard philosophy, so much the better, right? That was Swami Sarvapriyanji's point to Deepak Chopra in that one forum. Okay, anyway. So now we know from Thomas Nagel's paper, you can't objectify the subject. We know from David Chalmers' paper, Hard Problem of Consciousness, there's no causal link between the uh, brain and the mind. So now we have to ask the question, how then can you say that matter produces consciousness? You can't. 
You cannot yet make such a statement. And not only can you not make it now, you can never make it because, and this is by the way, called promissory materialism, where you say that today we don't know the link, but tomorrow we will. Meaning in 50 years time, we'll unravel the mystery. We'll have better instruments. No, that won't work either because from Thomas Nagel's paper, we get this idea that no, they're categorically different. So no amount of improvement in the field of objective study will ever illumine the illuminer, will ever make headway into the study of the subject. That won't work because of the category error. So that means that nor will you be able to do it in the future, nor can you do it now. There's no link between matter and consciousness. Therefore, you can't say that matter produced consciousness. That would be an incoherent position. Also, the next argument. Have you ever in your own experience, or more importantly, in principle, ever experienced objects, meaning um, matter and energy, apart from awareness? Have you ever? I mean, like, what would that be like? What would it be like to verify the existence of a table outside of awareness? Do you notice the paradox there? It's logically impossible to verify or prove the existence of matter and energy objectively, because in principle, such a proof requires one to whom the proof occurs. Right? So how can you say that there are tables that exist independently outside of awareness? That's no better than saying there's a boogeyman in the closet, mom. Right? It's a totally unsubstantiated position that in principle cannot be verified. It's violating all of Karl Popper's falsification theories, right? Like Popperianism, the falsification principle of science. It doesn't work here. It's like, if you are going to say that Freud's theory about the id is unscientific because it cannot be proven, then the entire material reductionist worldview is also unscientific because it too cannot be proven. Even in principle, it can never be proven that there is objectively, independently, such things as tables, chairs, whorls, quasars, etc. <laughs> such a proof requires an awareness, at least in principle. So therefore, we're left with this wonderful, startling conclusion that if there is indeed a world, it does not exist objectively and independently apart from consciousness. Consciousness is not the various objects that you can be conscious of. It's the faculty whereby you become conscious of those objects. And now we get to a very interesting and mysterious part of our lecture where we start to investigate the relationship between consciousness and Maya. Okay. So my, my goal today was to introduce the element of consciousness. Not element, I mean, that makes it sound material, but I wanted to introduce consciousness into our, our story so far, because it's only in the fourth rung of the ladder that we start to consider the relationship between consciousness and Maya. Ah, Lyric, this is a good question. It's like the cleaner the mirror, the better the reflection of the face. That's it. Consciousness is the face. Some mirrors are cleaner and shinier than others. That's, that's how you would explain it. Yes. You drink a cup of coffee, you don't become more conscious. Your mind, just, I suppose, becomes more reflective to the conscious. Because notice that you're conscious of being dull and sleepy and you're conscious of being alert and awake after a cup of coffee. Both alertness and dullness are both experiences in consciousness. You know, And I guess you could say more complex brains, those experiences, they might be more complex or more sophisticated, but they're still occurring to a basic consciousness. The same basic consciousness that a lesser brain would be occurring to. You know, like that you are aware is the same. What you are aware of is perhaps subject to change, you know, subject to coffee and brains and all that. Okay. So um, now we're at the, coming up to the hour now, I'll just take about like 10 or so, so more minutes to kind of just sketch out a little bit as to what this fourth rung of the ladder is going to be. Yeah, exactly. The divinity does not change. God is changeless. What changes is your ability to reflect it. So it's all about polishing the mirror of the heart and the mind. That's what practice is for. Practice is not to remove a veil. No such veils exist. Practice is not to um, give you something you don't already have. It's just to make that more manifest by polishing the instruments through which it will manifest. Okay, good. So now let's start with the ladder again. We've got Jagat, the perceivable universe, which we've reduced to Pancha Bhuta uh, Vilasa, the play of the five elements or the strings or the atoms or what have you. We've reduced that to Maya which is the incomprehensibility and paradox of time-space causality, that should give you tremendous renunciation for the external world. But if we stop here, you would have renunciation, but unfortunately, you might also have nihilism. That would be incredibly undesirable. Like you might be left with this feeling of nothing is real. And nobody is going to say that in spirituality. N not even Buddhist. Buddhists often get misrepresented as nihilist, but they they've never posited that nothing exists. 
They'll say no thing exists. They might not even go that far. They don't want to affirm what it is that exists. But something exists. It is an absolute truth. Nagarjuna clearly said that the Buddha in his Mula Madhyamaka Karaka, this, this leading scholar of Buddhism, Nagarjuna in the second century AD, clearly said that what the Buddha thought was an absolute truth. So if you think that the Buddha dismissed all reality altogether, then that would be a mistake. You know, he is teaching an absolute truth. He just won't say what it is. It's like once someone said to Sri Ramakrishna, uh, the Buddha is a Nastika. Nastika meaning atheist. And Sri Ramakrishna, he looked at the guy and he said, why, why should it be a Nastika? Why should it be an atheist? He simply didn't have words to describe what he found. Doesn't mean he didn't find anything. He's just reluctant to give it a name lest he do it a disservice. Sri, Sri Ramakrishna, you know, notice he's the single biggest influence in Swami Vivekananda's life. In fact, Swami Vivekananda, the first spokesperson of South Asian spirituality in the West, um, almost never talked about Sri Ramakrishna. Although everything he says is coming from Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Vivekananda is a channel through which the power of the avatar is manifesting in the world. And yet, scarcely does Swami Vivekananda mention his guru, mention his ishta, mention the god that he had the, 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 the joy to be a, a student of. You know, he even says, he calls him the mad Brahmin, the old man, he calls him a certain sage, but he almost never directly appeals to him. Now, once he was asked about this, someone asked Swami Vivekananda why he didn't speak of Sri Ramakrishna. And he said, it's like trying to sculpt an image of God. I might end up with a monkey or something. I'll do it a disservice. He knows that Sri Ramakrishna is inexpressible. The mystery of Sri Ramakrishna is inexpressible, even for someone as eloquent and articulate as Swami Vivekananda. So he won't even try. Though in some places he does. <laughs> he has composed mantras and stuff and poems to Sri Ramakrishna. And almost always he calls him the teacher of teachers, the greatest of all avatars. So he does praise Sri Ramakrishna, but always it's with the disclaimer, there's nothing I can say that will do this justice. So the Buddha too, perhaps had this similar experience of encountering reality and not having the words for it. And Ash, you're exa exactly right. Ashwara is exactly right. You risk making the subject an object if you call it something like the self or God or something, you know? Okay, now in the interest of time, I'd like to just kind of close in on the central point I wanted to make today, um, which is this. Now we've introduced an element, right? Consciousness. And now we're trying to relate it to Maya which is this world, this perceivable world. If you didn't have this element consciousness, if you didn't factor this into the picture thus far, you might be left with nihilism. This very scary feeling of, yeah, there's nothing I should fear. Wonderful, I'm free of fear. Yeah, there's nothing I should crave. Wonderful, I'm free of attachment. But God damn it, there's nothing. So my life is now a heartless void. It's, then you'll like dye your hair super black, start listening to metal and become like an emo kid, okay? Which maybe might be an undesirable outcome if you're like 35, I'm kidding. So let's not stop here. If we stopped here, it would be dangerous, tremendously dangerous. We must add this element, consciousness. I'm calling it an element, I don't know what else to call it, factor maybe, uh, bit. Let's call it consciousness. And this thing is God, okay? So when I say consciousness, you should think God. Because God is the infinite source of eternal aspatial consciousness. Now, I just said earlier that there's nothing that exists that exists outside of consciousness. Consciousness, therefore, is wholly inclusive of all existent things. Essentially, those of you who've been studying Advaita for some time know that essentially what we just said was that common to all existing things is existence itself. And existence itself is inalienable from consciousness itself. Not your individual perceptive consciousness, not you as a my, it's not solipsism. This is beyond solip, like it, it doesn't get like individual here. It's transpersonal. The idea that there is something called awareness. You are aware by faculty of this awareness and this awareness might as well call it God because it's beyond the world. You know, you're aware of time. Time is not aware of you. Therefore, time, awareness is not in time. Time is an awareness. You're aware of space. Space is not aware of you. Therefore, your awareness is not localized. It's not designated to a certain space. Like wherever you think your postal code is, yes, my awareness is there. No, 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 no. Awareness is aware of that postal code. It's not in that postal code. That postal code is in awareness. Awareness is not caused, nor is it an effect. It's aware of both cause and effect. So awareness, by all definition, is beyond time, beyond space, beyond cause and effect, is all inclusive. In it is every possible thing that was, is, and will be. Um, it's immaterial. It's not embodied, uncircumscribed by time unfettered by form, unencumbered by space. What do you call that but God? In fact, I don't know of any religion anywhere that posits God as an insentient mass of stuff, except maybe materialism, because I just said it is a kind of religion. But I mean, theistic religion, there's no theistic tradition in the world that depicts God as insentience. 
almost always, maybe with some exceptions, but almost always God, as we know it, is a being, pure being, pure consciousness, pure intelligence, and is the designer, the will behind this universe. Through the conscious will of this pure intelligence, this world came into being. This is the theistic worldview. And now the theistic worldview offers this story of creation. God created the world, you know, um, and that's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to realize that the world might be unreal, which perhaps the first three rungs of the ladder have conveyed, but God, the creator of the world, is the reality of the world. That alone is real. If you get to rung four at this point and stop, you have what I call a genuine working spirituality. You have what in Advaita Vedanta we would call the two fundamental prerequisites to starting your path in Advaita Vedanta. You would have vairagya, dispassion for the world, knowing that it will never fully fulfill you. After all, it's unreal. And you would have viveka, the understanding that there is something real. You can call it God, you can call it consciousness, you can call it spirit, Holy Ghost, the source, whatever you want to call it, but it's real. It must be because it's the one indubitable part of my experience. That alone is real. And I think two or three lectures ago, we talked about Descartes and why if he was smart, he would have become a monk because he would have realized that there's nothing but awareness that is indubitably true. So why should he not live by that? Why should he live by that which is unsure of and not by that which he is sure of? Spirituality is really about premising your life on that which is indubitably true. Awareness, that you are aware. You know, whether you call it God or not. So to live a God-centered life is to live an intelligent life insofar as God is seen as the one real thing and this world is seen as perhaps a creation of God, but an unreal creation of God. And even if it's a real creation of God, however beautiful the creation might be, how much more beautiful do you think the creator is? You know, like almost everyone enjoys meeting the musician who wrote the piece of music that you enjoy. Why be delighted by the garden when you can go and look for the owner of the garden, the gardener? You know, why be so fascinated by creation when you can seek the creator? This is enough for dualistic religion. This is enough for a working dualistic faith. Okay. So this is what I would argue is real religion. The world is unreal. Renounce it. Okay. God alone is real. Move towards that. Whatever that might be to you. This is where maybe most religion stops. Therefore, we could say in rung four, what we have now is chid vilasa. So I'm going to recap it. Jagat. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. Right, you got you got it. I, I, I show you. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. Then after Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, we got Maya Vilasa. What is Maya Vilasa? We can call it Chid Vilasa. The play of Maya is none other than the play of consciousness. You know, the Indian spiritual traditions are not as serious as the Western counterparts. There isn't like this grim bearded figure on a throne, like kind of begrudgingly creating a world. Usually it's like a playful entity that just wants to play in a childlike and simple hearted way. And so the creation of God is almost always called a Leela, a play. It's theater. It's God's theater. God so desired to play that she emanated this world into existence. That's the opening line from the Pratyabhikya Hridaya Sutra, right? Svechaya Svabita Vishva Munmilayati. Chitti Svatantra. God, Chitti, which by the way means consciousness. God, who is pure consciousness. In Sanskrit, this is the feminine singular noun. So God is here a she in Tantra. So goddess awareness, Chitti, she, yeah, right, Mahira? It's kind of cool. She, this mother, this ultimate mother, this womb of all creation and this maw of destruction, Makali, she is ever free. Why? Awareness is ever free. It's not in time, not in space, not in causality. It's not bound by time, space, or causality. She's ever free. And she must be because she's the creator of Maya. She cannot be at that same breath, like trapped by Maya. She created it. She who made the law can overturn the law, right? The snake is not poisoned by its own poison, right? So similarly, God is not bound by its own Maya. So she creates Maya. Why? For fun. Swa Icha. Using herself, Swa Bittau, as a canvas, she unfurled it all into existence. So that, this is the idea that we get in Tantra, we get in the um, Indian, I guess you could say dualistic approaches. By the way, I just cited a non-dual text, but it kind of gives you the sense of like, Okay, if you want to speak dualistically, then you could say God created the world. For what? For fun. For play. Now, if you stopped here, you'll be very happy. Like, not only will you be happy because you'll overcome all the illnesses and horrible, like, attachments and fears of the world, but you'll be happy because you will develop a working relationship with that source of all beauty. Um, and naturally, people who genuinely have this faith tend to feel very secure, very happy. And it's wonderful, you know, it's wonderful. Um, so we could stop here and you would have religion, but notice this is the fourth rung of the ladder. 
there are three more rungs of the ladder. There are three more steps of subtlety that we can go um, beyond this rather subtle and very high conception of dualistic religion. That's what's thrilling about non-duality. We go from God to Godhead, which only makes God more real and only makes your relationship to God more intimate. Because what could be more intimate than your relationship with yourself, right? Okay, now, um, <laughs> no, because I said I would have to go through the five things, I have to, um, to keep the word. And we'll do it briefly. I think next week we'll take it up in full. Uh, but I want to just give the five ways God could have created the world and just show you that there are problems with each of these. You know, the five ways that God could have created the world. Um, because I want to move us in closing today to the theory that God is you, you know. Um, and, and that actually opens the door for some serious devotion. If you look at the Sufi mystics, they're intoxicated with this non-dual flavor. Christ is intoxicated with non-duality. He sees no difference between him and God. Like Christ's true self is God. The Sufi masters, they're empty. How does Hafez sing? He says, I am a hole in a flute through which Christ's breath flows through. Listen to this music. Or he'll say, um, I am an empty reed flute played by the knowing hands of the Christ. Listen to this music. He'll say, the floor braces itself for the feet of a lover of God about to dance. The sky trembles when a saint raises his arms in joy because the sky knows that its precious stars and sun and moon can all end up rolling on the floor. Hafiz. I'm doing the Ladinsky translations. So anyway, any great master, uh, whether it's a Sufi mystic, a Christian mystic, a Buddhist, a Hindu mystic, they're almost always going to give some flavor of non-duality. Look at Mirabai's poems. Look at Ram Prasad's poems. Always a sense of, mother, I am empty. You alone exist. Like that, okay? So my, my hope is that when we go from level four to level five, we will end all the erroneous conceptions that God is out there and in its place establish the idea that God is in here as you as who you truly are. You're not who you think you are. You're actually God. And that's my hope. Once you see that, then that's true devotion, we would argue. Then your life will overflow in love and it will correct the error of frustratingly looking for God out there and killing other people who don't agree that that's, that's God. It ends the error of objectifying God. The No two words have harmed humanity more perhaps than communism and God, right? These two words are so prone to bloodshed because people are stupid. They think that if they change society, they will change minds. That's the stupidity of communism. The idea that if I change external things, internal things, things will change. Sorry, you know, the pigs are going to be pigs, whether or not you have a just society. You can't communism your way to a utopia. Um, so that's stupidity. The God thing is stupid too, because like my God is the only God exists. Where is he? He's over there. He's in this building. He's in this book. So I'm going to kill all of you who have other books, other buildings, other gods. It's stupidity because you're objectifying the subjective. So these two words, communism and God, are perhaps placeholders for the greatest human errors possible. But their intentions are good. So now I hope that when we move from three to, I mean, four to five, we will overcome the mistakes of communism and God and go to like something deeper. You will see that you are actually equal in the sense that there are no other people. You're all one person and that person is God. You see the tremendous political value of non-duality. You do get the ideal of communism, total equality in a metaphysical way you do get the ultimate foundation of ethics and you do get the ultimate devotion, ultimate intimacy with God. Okay, that's my hope. That's what should happen, Justin, if we properly understand non-duality. Um, yes, I, actually, I think I can do it in about five minutes if, if you'll give me that time, very quickly. Uh, we'll sketch, we'll sketch it. And then, yeah, <laughs> it's good to have you back, Brock. <laughs> so he's out at me, oh no, oh no. <laughs> kidding <laughs> all right so let me sketch this out i'm just gonna sketch it because we said we'll do it and then next week we'll explore it perhaps oh man it's gonna be a four-parter it seems <laughs> this stuff is taking so so much time but it's good to go slow and in the q a we'll unpack further okay five theories of causality and here's why they don't work remember we're going from chid vilasa the play of consciousness to the next rung of the ladder chid vivarta um, meaning an appearance in consciousness. So we're going to say this world was created by God. We're going to go from that to say this world is an appearance in God. And then finally, we'll say this world is nothing other than God uh, uh, because it's an appearance in God. And that means you, you are God. You alone exist. This world doesn't. Okay. So let's look at these five theories. Um, the first one is by Nyaya Vaisheshika, and it's called 
Asat karya vada. I'll put it over here. Asat karya vada. It means, karya means cause. Vada means school. So vada, like the school of causation based on nothing. So asat karya vada very simply is nothing produces something. Can somebody tell me what the problem with this theory is from a philosophical point of view? What's wrong with the idea of nothing producing something? It's producing something. Right. Nothing is producing something. What is producing something? Nothing. There's a problem. And Ashwarya, in philosophical terms, what would you call this? What kind of error is this? Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> uh the error of the mind yeah it is an error of the mind it's a it's an error of the intellect it's called a category error like we discussed earlier two and red right or subject and object this would be the category error of saying nothing which is a category unto itself produces something which is a category unto itself also so how can the category nothing produce the category something when they are categorically different right so this would be a category error you see, I hope you'll see why we took so much time today because we've already set up all the philosophical infrastructure we'll need for a rigorous kind of combating of all these ideas. So how can nothing produce something? That's nonsense. No one will sincerely maintain this because you know what? If you do say nothing can come out of something, you're basically one of those spontaneous generation people. You know how they used to believe that like maggots just suddenly out of nowhere appeared on meat or like how rats just suddenly appeared in the cupboard? Like, lit, I'm not kidding. Google it. Spontaneous generation was an actual scientific model that people believed. Can you imagine how we look back and we laugh at that? How in the future people are going to be looking back on our long cherished models and be laughing at them as we hopefully did a little bit today, laughing at some of our modern stupidities together, right? As a culture, we're all to blame, but, and we can all together learn better. Anyway, spontaneous generation is this idea that anything can come out of anything. If truly nothing can produce something, then anything can come out of anything. A mango seed can give you an apple seed. So that would be ridiculous. And it wouldn't be very scientific. It wouldn't be an actual inquiry into causes. So if you just leave it at that, you're not being scientific. You're saying, yeah, yeah, something just came out of nothing, you know? Exactly. It'd be weird. What would nothing use to create something? Like the, the, it, just, it begs the question. It, it just avoids the question. So you can't say nothing produced something. This is called asat karya vada. Nothing produces something. And we can check it off the list because it's a category error. By the way, if any of these theories are appealing to you, I hope that in the Q&A, you'll debate me. And I'm happy that Myra is here because we met in the world of high school debating. And I hope that you'll enjoy, Myra, some of the debates that will ensue. It's not quite as structured as what we're used to. There's no like POI structure in place. People just talk at me and then I talk at them and then we throw hands a little bit. No, <laughs> and no speaker scores are handed out. But I'm going to ask you, Myra, at the end of this talk, how I did. Okay, WDC style. I want to see whether what I scored. Myra's going to give me a speaker score <laughs> based on how well I proved <laughs> <laughs> and in the next week's lecture, my second speaker will give you the next three arguments anyway. So Asat Karya Vada, this obviously cannot be, it's a category error. So let's go to the next one. Sat Karya Vada. This is the idea from Sankhya. So remember, Asat Karya Vada is from Nyaya and Vaisheshika. Also, I should say here that in the materialist scientific community, that was kind of the dominant idea for a while. But then they realized it was kind of stupid, the spontaneous generation thing. So you know what they've suggested now, the cutting edge of quantum mechanics, as I've learned from Michio Kaku, is something called the quantum foam model or the quantum flux model, just something. It's called, it's, it's not a thing. It's like this mysterious ghostly foam and particles bubble up from out of it into existence. It's called quantum foam. So they would say like nothing is unstable. There's an unstability in nothing. And from this unstable nothing, there comes this quantum, but it's not really nothing. It's quantum foam. It's quantum flux. Where did that come from? Nobody knows. So we're back to square one, you know, um, but there is some kind of substratum called quantum form and it produces this world. Anyway, the, this, I guess you could call is some form of sat karya vada. So the next idea, I'll put it here, sat karya vada. Asat means unreal, sat means real. So sat karya vada is in Indian philosophy, the idea that something gives rise to something. The great example of this would be Sankhya, uh, Prakriti, Prakriti gives rise to this world. Prakriti, like this quantum foam, is an unstable primordial matrix. It's like a creatrix. And from it arises the three gunas. Now, the, in, it, in it is the three gunas in potential. And those three gunas like kind of shake up and then turn into this world. Rajas, Sattva, Tamas, all that. So that's Sankhya. Now, this idea is called the uh, co uh, effect pre-existence model because the effect is pre-existence in the cause. 
And so the effect is a potentiality in the cause, like yogurt is a potential of milk. And then somehow or other, that potentiality becomes manifest. Okay. Now, prakriti is an eternal, unchanging thing. It's just this eternal, there's, there's an eternalism here. Okay. Prakriti is eternal. And from this primordial matrix prakriti comes a world. Now, is the world changing or unchanging? Obviously, it's changing. So you're to say now that this eternal, unchanging prakriti is producing a transient, changing world? Hmm. Doesn't that also sound like a category error? The nothing cannot produce a something. Neither can the eternal produce a transient or the unchanging produce a changing. They can't both be true. You can't both have unchanging and changing. Uh, they're categorically different. So again, we have to invoke the principle of category error. And we say, no, the eternal prakriti cannot give rise to a changing universe. But there's an even if argument here, which is, okay, suppose it can. Suppose that an eternal unchanging prakriti, part of its ability is just to create a changing world. Suppose it can. We're still left with the question of where did that come from? You know, how, well, it's just quantum foam again. It's just quantum flux. Like it doesn't, it evades the question. You've just given me, you've just posited this thing called quantum flux or prakriti. And you've said that this unchanging thing produces changing, which is a category error. But even if I give you that, I don't, I'm not satisfied. You didn't tell me where prakriti came from. You know, it just is. Well, it's not very scientific. That sounds like spontaneous generation also. So we can cross prakriti off the list. That would be satkarya vada. Next is karma vada. Perhaps the most... Um, no, no, exactly. So that, and Brock is giving a third argument because if you're saying the unchanging Prakriti can produce a changing Prakriti, not only is a category error, but you just said Prakriti changed. How can Prakriti be unchanging if it just changed into a world? If it just acted and action is a change, production is a change. So that would be crazy. How could Prakriti change into a world if it is indeed unchanging? Okay, so that tackles the Prakriti thing. Now, um, next is Karma Vada. Karma Vada, and by the way, next week, I'm, I'm going to go into it in more depth. This I'm just sketching because I said I would, so I want to for truth, for truth's sake, and then we'll just leave it at that, okay? So Karma Vada is perhaps the most common theory. We looked at Nyaya Vaisheshika, we looked at Sankhya. Karma Vada is perhaps the most widely held Indian theory, and it's the idea that all effects have causes. Causes ad infinitum. Of course, this will give you the problem of infinite regress, because if every effect has a cause, you can just go on and on and on and on ad infinitum, and that would be a problem. Philosophically, infinite regress is like you're not positing anything. You're, again, evading it with this infinite series. But there's a deeper problem here. If this series is beginningless, doesn't it sound like also endless? If every effect had a cause ad infinitum, then there would be no end to this thing called karma, this thing called samsara. There would be no final effect. And as a result, you would not have moksha. The very idea of spirituality as the end of birth and death and rebirth, as the way out of the cycle of samsara, that would be rubbished by a beginningless series. The series Anadi, a beginningless series, sounds dangerously like an endless series. And that would be in violation of the principal goal of spirituality, which is freedom from the cycle of cause and effect, from the wheel of birth and death. And even if you say it does end, there's another problem. Even if I grant you that it ends, then you're saying moksha begins. And anything that begins must have an end, as Aishwarya pointed out. So if moksha begins at some point in time, presumably when this beginningless series, karma, ends, then that moksha that started must also be a moksha that ends. Anything that starts must end, right? So that's another way of dismissing karma vada. The fourth one is called vishisht advaita vada, which is perhaps a very sophisticated way of saying, no, God is the world. It's like panentheism. The idea is that God produces the world using her own body. Right? Vishva Sharira Shivaika Eva Rupa Kevalam. No, sorry. Vishva Sharira Shivaika Rupa Eva Kevalam. God is the being whose body is the universe. And Aishwarya is one step ahead of me. I just quoted a tantric source. Yes. In tantras, they say, um, you can't say it's, Tantra is very wide. So there's like all these different schools. And the highest Tantra, like we're studying on Thursday, wouldn't say this. But yeah, you could say in many places, Tantra and Vishishtadvaita, qualified non-duality, would say God produces the world, but not as some other thing that exists independently and objectively apart from it. Not like the Asatvada or Satvada kind of model. Not like the Karmavada model. Not like that. There's no beginningless series of cause and effect. God creates the world using herself as the canvas. So her body is the world. 
panentheism, but no, it wouldn't be pantheism. It's panentheism. And don't, no, no, be very careful about any statement Tantra is, okay? It's almost always going to be wrong. Anytime you say Tantra is, whatever you say after that, you're going to be wrong because it is and it isn't. Tantra is a lot more than what you might posit. Okay. Anyway, uh, save that for the Q&A. Let's just finish with one more thing. So this, this is a problem, right? Because if the cause is the effect, like one integral whole with parts, and that part is called the changing universe, then again, you're saying the unchanging is the changing. Again, there's a category error here. And not only that, you're saying God is a composite. And as we know from the Buddha, anything that's a composite will break apart. God can't be a composite. God has to be one integral whole. So you can't say the unchanging God produces a changing world, nor can you say a God who is undivided and whole is a composite. That would be problematic. And it's also kind of weird to say one part doesn't change and one part does change. It's about as weird as chopping the head off of a chicken and expecting the bottom part to still lay eggs, right? That's kind of what Shankara would say. Shankara does say that. He's saying it's kind of weird to say a part of God changes and a part of God doesn't. Okay, for a variety of reasons. And finally, you get this idea of the Artha Kriya Karitvam of the Buddhist, which dodges the question entirely and says, we have to accept this world as real. Uh, I mean, this is one school of Buddhism because it works. If I'm thirsty, I drink and I'm not thirsty anymore. If I'm hungry, I eat, I'm not hungry anymore. There's a practical utility to this world. It must work. And therefore, it's a utilitarian truth model, like utility, instrumentality, we call it in modern, modern scientific language. Because it works, it must be true. That's not true, though. Newtonian mechanics is not true next to Einstein, Einsteinian mechanics, but it works. You can use Newtonian mechanics to find Halley's Comet. Newtonian's mechanics has instrumental value, but that doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean that Newton's version of reality maps onto reality. Einstein's version of reality probably maps onto reality better. Though we say one is for big things, one is for small things. That's the idea of instrumentality. It doesn't necessarily guarantee truth. And even if it did, it's no more true of this world as it, than it is of a dream, right? If I'm thirsty in a dream and I drink water, I won't be thirsty anymore. So just because things work in a dream doesn't mean it isn't a dream. And now we come, having walked through all these five theories, to what Gaudapada wants to say. He wants to say then that this world could not have been caused by some separate entity called God. You know, it could not have been caused by God for these variety of reasons. Nor could God be the world, like in pantheism or panentheism. So he's dismissed basic theism. He's dismissed pantheism. He's also dismissed panentheism. But he hasn't dismissed God. He's saying God didn't create the world. That's his solution. It's called Ajata Vada. Ajata Vada or Viverta Vada. And I'll explain it more next week. The idea here is that this world is like a dream. You didn't create the world. You didn't create the dream. It just came into being and it went away. Similarly, the desert didn't create the mirage any more than like uh, a rope created a snake in the darkness. No, it just appeared. It's an appearance. There's no snake there. There's no oasis there. There's no world there. It was just a false snake appearing in a real rope. It was just a false oasis appearing in a desert mirage. It was just a false dream appearing in a real mind. Like all of these are examples of things coming into existence, not as actual real existing things, but rather as appearances that come and go within something that does exist. The awareness that is called Brahman, that is called God, that is your fundamental nature. So this is called Vivartavada or Ajatavada. And it is the solution to all these problems of causality. You don't have to posit a cause if indeed there's no real effect to explain. Okay, let's stop there. Thank you for the extra time. You know, um, needed it because I didn't want to leave you high and dry. So let's end here. Um, here's the model, okay, again, starting with Jagat, the world, perceivable world. We reduced it to Pancha Bhuta, the five elements, the play of five elements. We reduced that to Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya. Now we reduce that to Chid Vilasa, the play of the um, uh, consciousness, which is God. And then we reduce that to Chid Viverta, which we'll explain more next week. So it's not the play of God, it's an appearance in God. And then from that, we'll go to Chin Mayam. And then we'll finally end with Chin Matram. So the, the six and seven are high level Vedanta, like the loftiest of Indian philosophy. So we'll save that for maybe two weeks down the road. I will close with something from Sri Ramakrishna. And it goes like this. Once a person asks Sri Ramakrishna, why is there suffering? Essentially, this person is asking, why Maya? Why does Maya exist? And Sri Ramakrishna starts by saying, it's the inscrutable will of God. Inscrutable. Who understands? Who understands her will? And this guy is not satisfied. 
By the way, there's a very deep philosophical reason why you can't explain Maya. Maya is causality by definition. You can't ask for a cause for causality. That would be philosophically problematic. But anyway, he just says that simply Sri Ramakrishna says, uh, no, uh, it's another devotee, but Sri Ramakrishna simply says, no, it's not, it's not um, understandable to us. But the guy is not satisfied. You know, he pushes and he says, no, there must be a reason. Tell me. So Ramakrishna, having been pushed in this way, now says it's god's sweet will it's her sweet will you know and then he he gets angry he says what so god's will is to cause suffering what kind of a god is that that's terrible god's will is to cause suffering he's he's so unsatisfied with that sri ramakrishna gives him the next level of subtlety he says it's actually all her play so from will it's become play now and that seems to anger him even more will he could understand play he, he was pissed he was like oh it's play for her it's suffering for me and Sri Ramakrishna mysteriously leans in and, and probably says, almost like so chilling and eerie how he says this, you know, it's play for her, it's suffering for me. Sri Ramakrishna says, but who are you? <laughs> Om Purnamada Purnamedam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hi Hari Hi Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu Om That which is unseen is whole. That which is seen is whole. From the unseen wholeness pours forth the seen wholeness. As an ocean is undiminished nor aggrandized by the falling and rising of waves, so too am I, consciousness, unchanged by the rising and falling and appearing of worlds within me. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Hmm. <sighs>